Welcome to those of you who are, are joining us. This is the Creative Commons um, lightning talk session for Open Education Week. Go ahead, Steve. And hi, everyone. I'm your host. I'm sorry about that, but I am your host, uh, Stephen Downs. Uh, some of you may have heard of me, some of you not. Either way, you'll get the same experience here in this session. We've got seven wonderful people uh, here to give you seven minute presentations on topics related to open education. I can't wait to get to them. Um, and I'm just sort of stalling a wee bit so that people will be able to join. Um, if you have questions, uh, hover your mouse over the uh, screen in front of you, and you'll see the, uh, the little Q&A dialog pop up at the bottom, and you could submit your questions there. Um, I will see those questions, and so will the participants, so be nice. Um, and we'll have some time after each of the talk for a quick um, uh, a quick Q and A, um, and I'll pass on your questions and and grill the contestants. Um, and I am seeing chats come in on the chat as well. I'm watching that, so have fun. I love back channels. Uh, so, like I said, we got seven people here. Uh, the uh, the first person I've got all the pronunciations of their names done ahead of time, and now I've completely forgotten them. Um, so that was time I could have spent doing something else. Uh, so to begin, okay, well, we've got Catherine Curry, uh, Carolyn Stevenson, Sybil Preeb, Alan Levine, Liza Long, Suzanne Joachim, and Judith Sebesta. And I'm sorry after all of that if I did mispronounce your name after all that. I'm really terrible at names, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, we're going to begin with uh, Catherine Couré, and uh, the bio here says, Catherine is an applied researcher who loves making change happen in systems with dedicated and diverse teams, but she's kept it a secret where she's calling from, so maybe she'll tell us. So I'll turn the stage over to you, Catherine. You're on. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. And let's open this up. And what I'm talking about today is enabling OER at no additional cost. And I've now just got to get so that I can open uh, this. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I just want to. Okay, so what, I, what I'm really wanting to do today is I will start with the origin story. Um, during the apartheid era, I was privileged to spend a year in America just north of Chicago, and it was revelatory to me that the extraordinarily vibrant arts and creative industry sector was underpinned by a beneficial tax regime, particularly in relation to tax deductible donations. And hence, in the post-apartheid era, when I was asked to buy a large corporate donor for, which, for whom I was working, that I needed to look into the sustainability of the sector, obviously, tax and tax deductibility was one of the things you were wanting to look at. And in relation to this, the apartheid regime did not, uh, did not recognize civil society. They were non-governmental organizations. They were not governed by laws. They actually saw them as an, realistically as an existential threat to their continued existence. So there was no beneficial tax regime. There was no NPO sector. They were all just called non-governmental organizations. And at the dawn of the post-apartheid era, we were really concerned about the regulatory environment, but also how do we support it. And hence, one of, amongst many of the papers I looked at around strategy and policy was that of how do we enable OER or how do we enable um, tax. And uh, to my delight, within the initial tax codes, I found that there was this little sentence that indicated that they could open up a section called 18A to civil society generally. Um, at the time, it was only reserved for universities. Um, and specifically Afrikaans-speaking universities initially because English-speaking universities were seen as the bastion of anti-apartheid activism. 
So what we then did was I went to the board, the factories and accountants, they loved the idea and they thought, okay, we need to engage civil society and so on. And as a result, between 94 and 2000, finally we had 18A extended and it went from under 100 to over 30,000 organizations now benefiting. So if we look now in terms of what is happening from a, um, our responsibilities for OER, Internationally, there's a UNESCO recommendation on OER. South Africa is a member state and hence needs to abide by the recommendations. However, how do we do it? And if we look at it within the recommendations under section 2.A, they talk about developing and implementing policies which encourage educational resources developed with public funds. So it's already there in the UNESCO recommendation. And just as an aside, I would love to note that the Cape Town Open Education Declaration 2008 specifically talked about public funds for public goods, where they said ideally taxpayer funded educational resources should be open educational resources. So the framework in terms of policy was first you engage with civil society, you need to define, map, capacity build, engage with government. Um, and I'm just going to breeze through this. This has already been presented to civil society within South Africa in a number of forums. Um, we, we are noting from a definitional purpose that it's a UNESCO definition. There's been a lot of mapping, Paul West, Cable Green, Jonathan Porritz, of how does the UNESCO definition relate to the CC licenses. We've also discovered that Wikipedia we need and we are launching on Friday. There's a, a lot of people look to Wikipedia, but a lot of those are outdated and also need more nuance, need more. If you're going to engage with government, you need to make sure that everybody knows how, what maps. And what I have done is via the people whom I originally engaged with around tax, um, International Relations Department, they have a desk that deals with UNESCO, engaged with them. They then recommended us send a proposal directly to the head of the tax authority. Um, the answer has been, that's really interesting, but you need to take it to Treasury and Finance because they're in charge of tax policy. There'll be stakeholder engagement. It is a long process, but we are kicking off. So my basic feeling is we need to think global, but act local. Um, we always talk about dark money, but in South Africa, corruption aside, one needs to see tax as bright money. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the, the few who are rich. And um, the Brookings Institute talked about how the tax policy challenges are need to be resolved because it's vital to the success of South Africa's effort to sustain a multiracial democracy. And in that level, tax is actually very sexy and very interesting. And that's it. And I really ask people to engage in, in dealing with it in their own country to make the change. All right. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, again, I remind people that uh, you can submit questions in that big question thing. I see Cable Green is applauding and other people are applauding. So that's very nice. Um, I don't have any questions yet. But I do have a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. I told you I'd grill you. On uh, slide 11, you said that yes. uh, Creative Commons non-commercial is not an open education resource, which means I have produced no op open educational resources, which so. distresses me. <laughs> uh, no. Slide 11? Yeah, maybe I got that wrong. I could I have, it went by pretty fast. Yeah, there it I'm is. Having, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm having difficulty making, uh, making it large because the, uh, yeah. yeah. So OER in CSA, they are OER. Yeah, That's where, you're right. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the uh, non-derivatives that are not OER. And, and why is that? Well, you can't revise and remix, easy. You've failed two of the three R's. Okay. I mean, two of the five R, so it's a three R and not a five R. <laughs> two of the five R. <laughs> okay. mm. So, so a passing grade is greater than sixty percent here. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, here it's a hundred percent. Creative Commons requires a hundred percent compliance. 
okay. Um, is, I'm looking for any more questions, not seeing any more questions. And what we've established thus far, uh, besides the interesting observation that tax policy matters to open educational resources, which is probably where I should have focused my question, but I know nothing about South African taxes. Um, but we've also established that I can't see, but uh, I think we knew that. Um, so next up in our list of presenters is Dr. Carolyn Stevenson, who the biography says is currently a full-time faculty member and faculty advisor for Purdue University Global School of General Education, uh, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, which is my home department too. Um, go ahead, Carolyn. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm actually going to stop my video because of some bandwidth things that, of course, start to happen whenever we give presentations. But I'd like to thank you all for, for joining today. And um, with that, we're going to talk a little bit about promoting educational equity through OERs and degree plans. And really thinking about the ways that OER can develop a level playing field by allowing access to learners from all different socioeconomic status, especially during the last two years with the pandemic situation and living in this sort of volatile economic climate um, and it, the high cost of textbooks, the high cost of tuition is frequently a barrier to higher education. And um, according to the college board, there's a recommendation that students at a private four-year college in the US have a budget of about $1,200 per year for textbooks and supplies. And that's really a significant out-of-pocket cost that learners have to quickly come up with if they don't want to fall behind in their courses. And unable to come up with that cash, learners and their families often have to use credit cards, adding to that whole debt situation, and really making higher education, college specifically, not available for, for many learners. OER on the other hand, can save learners an average of about $100 per course. And with that, OER ensures free first day perpetual access to required learning materials and helps to eliminate the barriers to higher education that have become more insurmountable in this COVID-19 economy. OER also, the slide has a number of benefits. We can all, I hope, come up with a laundry list, double this list, share this information with people at our institutions. But there's another piece that I think is critically and personally important is that OER supports culturally relevant learning and social justice, justice efforts as well. So unlike that copyrighted material, OER's open licensing can help enable the di diversification of voices represented in our curricular materials. Faculty can adapt that material to reflect a variety of perspectives and backgrounds, including those that traditional textbooks don't always incorporate. OER can even engage our learners in revising or remixing the content to better reflect their own lived experiences, aligning with many of the DEI initiatives that are going on, allowing our learners to have the voices and to share those lived experiences. Learners can also create OER to educate their communities on important social justice issues. So, we also have to think about ways that OERs are flexible as well in these uncertain times. 
The slide here is just uh, one of many resources uh, from Open Washington. I like this resource because it has a, it's kind of a one-stop shop that you can just click and find a number of, of different resources available. Um, and I encourage everyone to share this information with faculty, with administrators, with your learners in the classroom, because it provides that that element of equity when a learner, especially adult learners, doesn't have the time or may feel intimidated about going it to a, a campus resource, be it online or be it in a traditional setting, show them the OER and let them become sort of masters of their own learning. The other piece is that OER is, of course, very flexible and times are still uncertain on a very global scale and learners may need to withdraw from a course or drop out of school for financial or personal reasons, health reasons, caregiving issues, everything that the world is facing right now. And so with that in mind, it's important to ensure that learners can access their learning materials both now and later if they come back when they withdraw for one of these life issues, they have the materials that they need. And of course, the licensing structures of OER ensure that our learners don't have to buy or rent those test textbooks again. If they live, leave college and return in the future, they'll always have that access to the latest version of the learning materials. And, you know, really thinking about equity too, it's accessibility issues and how many OERs address these issues that are so critical to meeting the needs of all of our learners. OER puts our learners at the center. And with that, they have the power and it enables our learners to create their own openly licensed materials and really address issues that are current in today's society. Learners can understand that they have the authority to construct and contextualize the information that experts are not the only ones that have the capacity to create material. And with that, there's so many materials available too that we can upgrade our courses, our materials to ensure that accessibility issues are addressed. So here's a few links in this presentation that will be shared later on, on videos that have captions, some free online courses, again, sharing some additional resources available to share with individuals at your institutions as well. And, you know, overall, um, really thinking about that college is, is is not only a way to make individuals richer in, in knowledge and in financial gain, but an OER is, is not only a way to help those learners save money, we have a chance to rebuild a post-COVID university that sees basic needs as integral to any learner's academic success and actively develop ways to integrate those ba basic needs with the missions of our institutions. We have a chance to redistribute our resources away from you know, surveillance, educational technology and corporations that mine that, that learner data for profit and think more about the value of education in terms of how healthy, and safe and sustainable, it can make the publics outside the walls of the academy and how the academy can be more symbiotic with those publics. That's perfect, that's time. Wow, very nice. <laughs> uh, uh, I noticed in the uh, comments in the chat, Bridget McCarthy commenting, experts are not the only ones who have the capacity to create material. Yes, <laughs> and, and uh, I would certainly underline that as well. Uh, we have a question from Paul Stacy um, asking, do you think OER generates a savings for institutions or for government? And if so, how would we measure it? 
I think that's that's an excellent question. And I believe that it it does, it is cost effective for institutions as well. When you think about, let's take, for example, I teach 100% online, but ground campuses, for example, have a physical bookstore that they have to build a space and they may gather rent. Um, but with OERs, we can go away from those, those textbooks. Um, additionally, uh, it provides, it, a cost savings for institutions that have to provide um, that maybe are on a lower budget that don't have, you know, some some other uh, resources. For example, they cannot hire someone full time to be a writing center coach, a mentor, or or uh, other resources that that maybe you know private institutions that have that wealth can provide. And OERs, for example, can can help leverage. The institutional costs by and also equity for institutions that cannot pay those salaries or pay for those spaces to provide those resources and additional ways to support those learners. Great point, Sybil, too. It retains students, which brings money to the campus. There we go. So thank you. Do you think people where you are, are widely aware of the benefits of OERs? Or is it something that is known really only to the in crowd? With um, my institution specifically, Purdue University Global, I actually work with an open degree plan. It, it, we have two pathways for uh, a professional studies degrees and we're launching a master's degree um, later this month. My independent learners in the professional studies degree work at their own pace. And instead of paying a tuition-based uh, model, it is a subscription model. And they are not in a 10-week online course. They move through things at their own pace. I'm their faculty advisor, and I provide them only with OERs to help support their learning where they're taking assessments that align to outcomes moving through at their own pace. Um, additionally, our institution does promote OERs in our library, and we train faculty to integrate that into the classroom as well. Again, being very, very critical to adult learners who don't have the time, money to get, you know, who's going to get a special tutor, right, when you're managing all these things. Uh, so, but it's still, I mean, I'm still out there banging the drum because it's, it's, it's not as widely recognized, especially promotion with course development, we're seeing that. I just designed some capstone courses. OER is the only way to go, so. Okay, and I'm seeing Alan uh, Levine there busy writing his presentation. <laughs> um, up next, we have Sybil Preeb. Um, and uh, so welcome, and, and I should say, uh, first of all, Thank you, Carolyn, for your presentation. And we have virtual applause happening. Um, I'm really a terrible host, aren't I? Uh, Sybil Preeb, uh, okay, what do we got for Sybil? Is a college writer, sorry, a college writing teacher in the upper Midwest, which to somebody who doesn't live in the US means nothing to me. Uh, That's who nice. Likes <laughs> who likes books, bicycles, which I like, um, and blasphemy. So, uh, Sybil, over to you. All right, I'm going to assume everyone can see my stuff. And yes, I love blasphemy. And I think that I discovered um, how OEP uh, overlaps with ungrading, which is a very blasphemous concept to a lot of people. I teach at the North Dakota State College of Science. And I teach uh, College Composition 1, College Composition 2, and Creative Writing. So let's get rolling. Um, OK, a couple of definitions. Most of you know what open educational pedagogy or its practices uh, entail. Essentially, that's having students giving students more of a say in the classroom environment. And also, they end up kind of creating the materials for the course, whether it is a book or other things. Um, I have them add to an editable uh, Google Doc in one of my courses. The practice also gets away from disposable assignments and encourages less teacher control. And so if you have the link, which I think I threw in the chat to my uh, presentation, you can have the link here to a public folder where I keep all of my OEP ideas. 
The blasphemous idea of ungrading comes from the theory that feedback and reflection and student learning should be the focus of any course, not grades. I had this epiphany a couple of um, a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic, and realized that I just needed to back off. Um, for, for various reasons, but grading just wasn't working for me. This practice also includes less teacher control over assessment. Students assess themselves, they reflect, and the feedback by teachers, classmates, and others is highly valued. And I have another folder there of ungrading ideas for anybody who's curious. So here's our Venn diagram. There is a tiny bit, I left a little bit of like a, a crust on the edge of each side because I do think that maybe there is a slight difference between the two. Um, many would argue that pedagogy, that OEP has more of a creation, a product approach to it. They're creating things. The orange text in the center, bringing up how it's all student-centered, there's agency involved, the students have voices, they have control, they create things. And then on grading has, the, has assessment and process on the side there, but as we go to my next slide, you'll see that I, I do think that there is probably even more overlap between those things then there is differences. So I have differences with a question mark for that very reason. One might argue that OEP is more about creation and products. And one might argue that ungrading is just about assessment and process. But again, in the orange text there, you might have a student creating the assessment. So the one example I have here in pink, students could create the rubric. Well, that's assessment. They're creating the assessment piece, right? So there's another overlap there with the Venn diagram. Um, and then some might say, those who say, well, ungrading is just about assessment and process, but with ungrading, the students are going to create something. They might create an essay that backs up why they deserve a B in the course or what have you. So I still think there's a lot of overlap there, even within the arguments that people might make that there isn't <laughs> overlap. Um, all right, the teacher, did I miss anything? Here, back to student role. So the students, what did they do in each one of these uh, scenarios? In OEP, they compose um, maybe all or most of the course syllabus. I haven't gotten to that point yet, but I think that'd be really cool. Um, they might create all or most of the textbook or course materials. They might remix and revise OER. I do that with my students. And they also might create public projects that are not housed in the LMS. Um, Heather Maselli has a really great project with that, by the way, if anybody knows her on Twitter. With ungrading, the students are reflecting, they're assessing themselves, and they're deciding their own grade and backing it up with evidence which they might use grading, which teachers might use grading conferences for. Whoops, there we go, teacher role. So essentially I'm still the guide on the side, which is what I've always wanted to be. I didn't like being the sage on the stage. I thought I was the guide on the side, I was not. And so now I'm truly just facilitating their learning. I'm giving them a lot of feedback. And you can see those words, those statements that I just gave you follow in both of these situations in OEP and in ungrading. Let's see, I think this is my last important one. <laughs> what does this look like in my classroom? What does you know this Venn diagram look like? So I do right now have a final project in my college composition one class called the textbook tweak. The students look at my OER textbook that I've put together and I love, but I do allow them to tweak it. They go in and they figure out which chapters need help, which things do not speak to them. Is the language student friendly? Does Do I need more memes? Like I, I love my memes, but do I need more? <laughs> um, in a different class, I have students contributing to different topics in an editable Google Doc. So if the topic is gender or um, the police, they will add podcasts and uh, videos and articles to that editable doc, and that becomes the material that we look at. With ungrading, the students are reflecting in my class, they're populating the LMS, which is Blackboard in my case, without declaration quizzes. Dr. Laura Gibbs would be the person to look for on Twitter for that idea. And I don't assess them on their behavior. So uh, late work is accepted and absences are not punished. Here are some resources. There's so much out there. There's truly probably more to OEP, but I love the Open Pedagogy Notebook, so I just really wanted to give them credit. And then with ungrading, if you get on Twitter, you will get sick to, sucked into like the black hole that is known as ungrading like I did. You'll try it. You'll fight it. You'll fight it for a long time. I know I did. I was like, no, those are hippies. I don't want to do I can't do it. I can't do it. And then you get sucked in. You realize they have cookies. They have really good cookies, and you want to eat them. Anyway, so there's my ungrading stuff, and there. I think I, I tested myself yesterday, I was at six minutes, so I might have beat it, but anyhow. 14 seconds left. You did amazing. Wonderful. We will Question. now twiddle our thumbs for 14 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
So still waiting for questions to come in on the chat or the Q&A thing. Nobody uses the Q&A thing. I don't even know why it's in the Zoom interface. I've never seen it used. Oh, and just here, we got a question from, okay. Uh, uh, from Bridget who says, I keep thinking this week that the students who need OERs most may not be enrolled in schools or universities. So this isn't directly to this topic, but I think it's still relevant. So I'll keep continuing asking it. Uh, do you think the OER movement has been too reliant on academia to promote and disseminate OERs? How can we reach people of all ages outside the formal educational system? So, um, Sybil, you can address this directly if you want, but the uh, remaining panelists are also tasked now, because this was addressed to everyone, with answering that question. Sybil, do you have any comments on that? Um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I know that um, my family hasn't gotten away from me talking about it, so it's getting it's getting um, spoken about or spoken to all over. I do think it's possible. I know when my family has talked about um, sharing, like I, I lost an uncle during the pandemic, not to COVID, but to other things, and we were talking about sharing his writings and I brought up, why don't you openly publish those things? And they were very hesitant. They wanted, it was almost as if they wanted the non-derivative, you know, clause on there because they don't want anybody to change his stuff, which makes total sense to me, but I do think it exists. Um, it's just a matter of the conversations happening. And I'm not sure if academic minded people like ourselves would know if those things are, and they, they might be. And really, I got to give a lot of credit to the librarians that I know you gotta, we gotta, I mean, you think that the librarians are probably talking to all sorts of people about this. Librarians are like the, how, the hub for most of our stuff as far as in our sense of the world or whatever. So people come in and they're looking for things. They might see our textbooks sitting around and ask what, what's going on here. So I think it's being talked about. I just don't think we maybe know. I don't, I, that probably doesn't answer anybody's question, but. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good answer. Well, the stern taskmaster has spoken. Uh, it is time to move to the next person, um, who I understand is a dog, and uh, so is living proof of the idea that on the internet nobody knows you're a dog because most people think he's human. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Anyhow, this is Alan Levine who first launched a web page on a Mac SE30 in 1993, even before the web was invented. Just kidding, Alan. Uh, and has not ceased in an amazement, excitement for what it offers since. Currently, somehow employed as the Director of Member Strategy and Community Engagement for Open Educational Global, which is a pretty good promotion but mostly just wants to make digital art, tinker with web building and write to his blog. And I might add, I am a regular reader of his blog. Alan, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. That was quite the monologue. And so um, I, uh, do you remember on uh, the old Monty Python when they said, and now for something completely different? <laughs> uh, I don't think anything's gonna blow up, but, uh, I don't know how practical what I'm going to share is, but I just want to do some storytelling. So once upon a time, uh, Stephen set the stage, there was a young instructional technologist at the Maricopa Community Colleges who kind of came across this worldwide web thing and was excited about the idea about creating and easily doing hypermedia. And so he was sharing it, but he was also like publishing, you know, photos and practicing making web pages. And so one day out of the blue, there came an email from a guy named Bernie from Germany who asked about this photo that this young man had um, on his website, uh, actually just buried in a directory uh, of a car in Death Valley. Uh, I'm not going to finish that story, but I can tell you uh, where to get it. So I've had sort of these experiences um, of working uh, on the early and current internet where just these things happen almost by serendipity. And so I always found them exciting for me, but I really felt like other people experience them and more people should experience them. And it might be just a prime motivator. So my, my favorite one 
is this one about uh, an orange flower of, of all things. So uh, I found out early um, on Flickr uh, that if you posted pictures of things and sometimes said like, unidentified, or I don't know what this is, that people would just on their own kind of find it. They look for those things and they try to help. And I think that says a lot about the spirit of the internet. So I sort of had this collection of uh, photos that you could find, and you can even see how old the interface here is, if you remember Flickr from back then. And I was using this as an example for a talk in 2007, I was doing for teachers um, in Hobart, Tasmania, uh, down there in Australia. So hello to my Australian friend in the audience. And, you know, it's part of a thing about getting people excited about the potential for sharing and what can happen on the internet. And I just explained this phenomena and I pulled up this as a search result. And I said, look, I have like 12 examples, like someone in the audience, you know, pick one out. And so someone said, you know, I don't know. The first person said, well, the orange flower. And so there's two orange flowers and I just happened to pick one. And this was a really good example because at the bottom, there was a comment um, from someone named Kirsty who said, I suspect it is, and I always mispronounce it, but she said what kind of flower it is. And that was neat. That was my example. That was the power of the internet and sort of people you don't know helping you out because this was available out in the open. So just as a small like geographical reminder, I'd come there from where I lived in Arizona all the way down there in Hobart, Tasmania. And that was my point, that was done. I was ready to move on with the next thing in my presentation. This hand goes up in the back of the room and this woman says, that was me. So literally the presentation stopped, people were gushing, we had to get a picture and just the odds of that just still astound me to the day. And so that kind of energy is sort of something that I, I really um, wanted to continue happen, uh, not for me necessarily, but also for other people. And so this is sort of happens as the spirit of, of openness. And what I found is like, we, we focus a lot on the sharing side and the publishing, and, and that's all great. But there's sort of the participation side of the person who finds the content and reuses or ask it or says, um, that's really great, or I just really appreciate what you've done. So there's sort of a interesting reciprocity um, thing at work here. And so I became interested in this phenomena and I'm going to go over to, um, there was this conference, this little conference called the uh, Open Education Conference. Uh, 2009 was the first year um, that it had moved from Utah where David Wiley had hosted it to Vancouver. And I really wanted to go. And so um, at the time there was a lot of you know focus on open courses, there was these things called MOOCs that, that Stephen made popular. And then um, there was a lot of emphasis on content and OERs. And I was kind of interested in like these stories, like are there more of these stories that happen? And so I put out a call early and I made this website, um, actually it was originally called Amazing Stories. And there's another copyright story why I had to change it um, that involves lawyers and et cetera. But um, I had this presentation, I had this like nifty little media wall where I could I presented live on the web, like I'm doing now, this thing called Cool Iris, technology I represent. Um, and so there's a collection of stories and they came from people I knew and didn't know. So I put up a Google form and I think I collected them. Some of them about photos, things that happen, you know, photos are easy things to share. So a lot of times people have these stories about unexpected things when their photos get reused. Um, people get jobs out of the sharing. There's a story from Stephen here. It's great to hear. Um, a student who had worked with my colleague, Barbara Ganley, because she participated and produced her work online, she ended up um, getting um, this great opportunity. Um, other people as well. And so this was something I was fascinated with and, and I wanted to share. And I've done it over the years. And I'm just going to see if um, I probably didn't do the right sharing uh, tab thing. I'm going to share again because I forgot to click that little thing to share the sound. You know, no one does Zoom perfectly, just to remind people. So just one example of many. Um, Donna Fry was a principal um, who I got to know through blogging um, at, based in Thunder Bay. And she had done this really great project where some of her students got in touch with um, educators at University of Regina, and um, they were interested in um, uh, 
um, Chris Hatfield, who was the Canadian astronaut who, who was up in the space shuttle, he was like singing songs. And so he had this one particular song and they came up with this idea to do this thing called a lip dub. And that's where they take a song and students just take turns mouthing like one line of it and they assemble it into one video. So that was a great project project and so that too could be the end of the story so let's see if i can get donna to tell it herself but then one morning i was outside and being a little bit of a space geek myself i um i'd been tracking the international space station quite a lot following on twitter knowing sort of when it was going to go over but one morning i was out and i looked up and, and it went over i hadn't realized that that was the right time and i thought wow you know commander hatfield's up there i wonder if he's actually seen the video tribute that we did to the music that he he recorded. And so I waited admittedly till I, I knew admittedly till I knew that he's usually on Twitter. And um, I tweeted out, uh, you know, at Commander Hatfield, did you see? That? Okay, well, I really messed up my timing here. And I just want to let people know that uh, I am still collecting uh, these stories on a website. Um, there's a place where you can share them in video or audio form. And usually when I'm better with my time management, um, I'm able sometimes to ask people in the audience. And I know um, there's probably lots of stories here that people have experienced. Uh, there's one I really wanna get, and I'll just ask them to contribute from Cable Green, which is probably the most amazing story of sharing because it involves a liver. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that because I've horribly gone over my time. Thank you for uh, letting me uh, play with my little story idea. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. And I assume you were using open broadcasting system there for your interesting presentation. For the people who are participating, uh, if that happens again, I don't know if it will, and you're looking at a little tiny box, um, what you can do is in the upper right hand corner of your screen, there's a thing there that says view. And you can click on view and alternate between speaker and gallery. So when somebody comes on using something like what Alan did, just click on that button and click speaker and you'll get the full screen experience. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Steve. Not a problem. And it was OBS, right? Uh, yes, it was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do recommend if you're doing presentations on Zoom, look up open broadcasting system. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Okay, next up we have Liza Long, who, uh, as department chair of integrated studies and an assistant professor of English at the College of Western Idaho, which is a beautiful country, um, underrated, but beautiful. Uh, Liza loves to read, write, and discuss big ideas. And she's a co-author of an OER first year composition textbook, Write that matters. Liza, stage is yours. Thank you, Stephen. And I should have remembered to have that book up so I could put it in the chat. So, uh, wow, I feel so lucky to be here today, mostly because I've got extensive and copious notes from all of you about some great resources. That's one of my favorite things about the open education community. And I uh, came to this lightning round in March 2020. Um, like many of you, I had nothing else to do with my time all of a sudden because of COVID. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Stephen. And uh, so I embarked on my fun pandemic project, which was this Write What Matters textbook, along with two colleagues, one at Lewis Clark State College, Amy Minervini, and then Joel Glad here at the College of Western Idaho. And uh, this really kept us going <laughs> through those long months. Um, but as part of that process, both Amy and I also took the Creative Commons licensing course. And before all this started, if you had asked me what OER was, I would have had no idea. I, I, even if you had told me it was open education resources, I wouldn't have known. But Creative Commons does such a great job of really explaining how valuable this is, not only to our own pedagogy, as we saw with Sybil's presentation on open pedagogy, but also for our students. So in some ways, I feel like what I want to show you today is very similar to um, some of the things that Sybil was talking about. I do not have a presentation. I feel like a little bit of a slacker, but I do have some websites I want to show you. So I'm going to be talking to you today about a student created OER. Uh, and this came out again out of that, um, out of that 
Creative Commons, yeah, thank you, Cable Green, for putting that in the chat. The, out of the Creative Commons course that I did where I learned for the first time about renewable assignments. And this is an example of something my students are using as a renewable assignment. You are welcome to use this with your students if you teach English. So I teach at the English 211 Literary Analysis course. This is traditionally a very difficult course for students, and I'm not going to lie. I was listening to what Sybil said about ungrading and thinking, yeah, this is a class I wish I could use it on because the students, they all have to take this for their English major. I'm the only instructor who teaches it, so they got to get through me. And I'm not going to lie, like this is the first time for some of these poor, amazing writing students that they get a D on a paper. And it's always a little bit of a shock to them. But we designed this project because, oh, by the way, I have open and unlimited revisions, I should add. So if you do get a D on a paper, I expect you to revise it so you can get an A uh, with my feedback. But I think the culminating project in this course is a group project. Now, I know how some of us feel. I know how my students feel about group projects. Um, shout out to MatPat and Game Theory. I'm a mom of teenagers, so we are big MatPat fans in our house. But I mean, really, when you say the words group project to students, this usually instills terror, right? Those of us who've used these for students. Uh, and it certainly does with my students. But what I did was design this project. I'll go back to showing you again. To to replicate my own real world experiences in publishing. And I've had the opportunity to publish both with a traditional publisher and then to do the open education resource with my colleagues. Um, and so uh, this process, I'll just show you a little bit of what they do. The students um, put together a critical edition. They read short stories for my class at the very end of this is the group project culminating project for their class. They read short stories that are assigned to them. They apply for which short story team they want to be on through an application process. They choose a theoretical lens. This is the course that introduces them to things like deconstruction, Marxist criticism, um, those types of things. So they choose one of the theoretical lenses. And then they each produce uh, an essay about uh, the short story with a critical introduction, a group produced annotated bibliography looking at the scholarship. And then you can see, you know, this is a reader response, uh, deconstruction, they go through all these different lenses. So um, this ends up being quite a fun project for the students. It's really involved and they actually end up liking it. Uh, and I do want to make sure I sh make sure I share this in the chat. Let me get back to the home on this um, so that you all can look at this book later at your own at your own time. Um, but uh, what they what they do, I also am going to share the assignment with you because I do feel like this is a scalable assignment is something that really um, you could do in pretty much every kind of class, certainly any humanities class that I can think of. So I'll um, I'll share this in the chat as well. And I just want to walk through briefly the assignment so you can see how I deal with that, that existential terror that the students feel <laughs> when they hear the words group project. Uh, so as I mentioned, I designed this project to replicate my own experiences, both as a writer and working on publications as an editor. And so uh, there are both individual and group components to the assignment. This is all kind of broken down here. Um, they, they, this is one piece of the renewable assignment. They start by locating um, an essay on the theoretical lens that they plan to use in that student publication. And they write a, a short review for the class discussion board, um, basically you know, critiquing and providing feedback on the previous student's essay. And we actually use that feedback to go in and update and revise the essays. So they're CC BY, we can go in and use that to, um, to review and make our publication better by looking at previous student essays. Uh, then they, they also get a good example of what I'm expecting, right? And, and the fear of being published and being out in open really helps them to produce some top quality work. So that's from an instructor point of view, um, going from those D essays at the beginning of the term to these you know, publishable essays is really exciting for me to see with my students. So they have their individual analysis essays. They work with their teams on that. They put the annotated bibliography together as a group. Each member of the group has to supply sources. This helps to make sure that they have high quality sources in their work. Um, 
one of our goals in the course is to introduce them to literary scholarship. So we, we spend some time working with our librarian on JSTOR. And then they put that group critical edition together. Um, and this is where I think it's important if you're going to do an OER project like this, like it really has felt real world, both to me and my students. So I design each group. Each group has four different roles. And again, they apply and decide on the roles for themselves. The project manager role is, I think, the hardest, right? Sometimes students will be like, oh, yeah, that sounds easy. But this is basically the only student I'll be communicating with, barring some unforeseen catastrophes. The publisher works with me in Pressbooks, so they get that experience. I usually look for someone who has a little WordPress background. Annotated bibliographer, bibliography editor keeps that all on track and is a liaison to our librarian. And then the editor writes the critical introduction and makes sure that everything meets the project requirements. They do get to, their grade depends kind of on how they rate their group. They reflect on the assignment. I just wanted to end with what prior students have said. So my students really enjoy this project at the end. When first introduced to this project, I was pretty intimidated. There were a lot of steps. It seemed like it was going to take a lot of time. Um, once my group got settled and started forming a plan, I felt much better. I think the goal of every class you take should be to finish it up with your best work. And I would say this project made that possible for me. I love that. That was my goal. Um, working on beginnings and endings was something I never thought I'd be doing just a year ago. Contributing to the publication with my group was both educational and fun. Knowing that future literary analysis Alyssa students will see our work made the project even more exciting and worth the effort and my time is up so uh, I put the links in the chat and feel free to use its license CC by feel free to use it if it's useful to you and are there questions oh. <laughs> so thank you uh, I don't see any questions although I did see Jenrin commenting that she likes the uh the project management aspect of it and uh, me as a government employee i've learned all about project management how important was that to this project i, I think it's critically important but full disclosure my doctorate's in organizational leadership so it does give <laughs> me it does give me the chance to kind of put some of what i learned in that doctoral program into practice i feel like the project management role um one of the ways that that's really interesting in terms of replicating a real world experience, um, no one asked about the obvious conflict that occurs in groups when people don't meet their deadlines or whatever. And this gives the project managing students a real opportunity to get some leadership coaching from me for, well, how are you going to manage the situation? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the boss of this project. You know, you are, how are you, how are you going to solve it? And I try to help them troubleshoot that. Um, but I think it honestly is really helpful. Like Alan, put something about a dysfunctional group projects yeah they're they can be awful i had one group like this was a real world example they came in and they were like this one group member is not meeting deadlines her stuff's not going to be ready and you know they are graded as a group on their annotated bibliography and i said well here's here's the way it goes you're going to lose points on your annotated bibliography if you don't have her stuff in there um, but that's not going to affect your overall A in the class. There aren't enough points that you could lose for one group member being slacking off that if you were an A student, it's not going to cost you your A. So I do go in and reassure them. These are our top performing students in this class. So they come in with that mindset. It's, it's challenging. But it's their choice, right? Like they can pull the slack just like any of us could. We can pull, pick up the slack for a non-performing colleague or we can just let that ride, right? <laughs> So. Yes, I, I'm usually the dysfunctional part of the project, so I manage. Uh, <laughs> coming up yeah. next, we have Suzanne Joaquim. Um, and Suzanne works with California CC, oh, Community College? Yeah, must be. Uh, Academic Senate's OER initiative, where she helps train faculty and facilitates the collaborative creation of new OER, which is cool. She also trains faculty in online course design, which is probably thankless, and equitable grading strategies, probably also thankless. All yours, Suzanne. Thank, thank you. So yeah, I am going to be sharing with you some of the strategies, successes, and lessons learned from the California's OER initiative. And I wanted to just uh, first off say thank you to Ani Anukum for the background graphic that she created for the lightning talk. I liked it so much I used it for my presentation. So thank you. 
All right, so the OER initiative was started in 2018 when it was funded by the legislature for five years. It's being run by the Academic Senate of California Community Colleges. And our mission is to reduce the cost of educational resources by expanding the availability and adoption of OER. We're doing this in a couple of different ways. I'm gonna share just a few of them. One is to identify and address barriers to OER adoption. Another is to identify and fill gaps in the OER landscape. So this includes both textbooks, homework systems, ancillaries, all of the things that prevent faculty from going to OER. And finally, we're supporting local OER efforts so that when our time is up, they can um, carry on, right? That's the sustainability piece. The way we're doing that, we started with uh, connecting faculty together. So we have 116 colleges across a big state. And so we really needed to build a network of people that could help each other. We identified liaisons at each campus and we trained them. So it was a train the trainer kind of a thing. We trained them at OER basics, licensing, accessibility, all that good stuff. We give them a monthly newsletter that they can distribute to their institution. We ask them for information. So that's a two way flow of information and every month we have a, uh, a conversation where they can get together and brainstorm strategies uh, specific to whatever is happening on their individual campuses. We also identify discipline leads. So these are folks that are in particular disciplines and their role is to curate resources from wherever that can be used for specific classes. They are also asked to hold a webinar once a semester, once a year, where they either share new resources that are available or they have a conversation with others in their discipline to see what's needed and, and kind of start building that community of practice. Because I think we tend to get in our own little bubble. And uh, this is a chance for people to start really collaborating. Again, it's all about networking. And we've developed a website uh, that houses all of this stuff. And thank you to Stephen for putting that link in the chat. The other part of the process is to fill gaps in the OER landscape, right? So the first year we did this, we had faculty apply to individually create resources. And we realized fairly quickly that having one person creates a, creating a resource creates kind of a, um, a very particular viewpoint. And so from then on, we required that there have to be at least three faculty across three different uh, districts creating these resources. And the benefits are, I think are, are all fairly obvious, right? The more eyes that are on it, the more typos are taught, but also the more perspectives that are presented, right? We all have our particular worldview, the way we teach our class. And so having people from across the state create it means the, use, the resource is more usable globally. And also it's building community so that when these things get updated, it's not on one person's shoulder. Hopefully the, the whole group will keep updating it. So we do require collaboration and um, thank you, Liza, for your, your, your session right being right before mine because the hardest part of this is the project management. So we, we have to train faculty in the OER basics, licensing, accessibility, all of that stuff. But once we added this piece of collaboration, we realized we also have to train them on, on project management, which is not something that we're trained in as faculty. And um, we tend to be a squirrely bunch and hard to keep on task. And so this has been, I think, um, a challenging piece. We started to build tools. So we're helping to create resources and tools for them to uh, do the project management. And one of those is me and uh, my colleague, Shagun Kar, who's the other project facilitator. And we help the, um, the project lead do, do their work. So we're learning a lot as we speak. I do not have a background in any of this sort of thing. I'm a biologist, so I've been learning along with them. It's been fun. The next part of this is uh, sustainability, right? So that's the cultivate piece. And for, for cultivation, what we were looking at is how does this carry on when we're, when we're out of funds, basically. A few of the things we've created are a, a couple of open, open self-paced classes. So these are available to everyone. They're self-paced, they produce a badge, um, and those are, and OER basics and accessibility basics that, that people can take. The co-creation piece was hopefully going to help us with the sustainability again, because the more people that are building the resource, the more that are updating it. And we've been connecting with external groups. So other educational systems in our state, but also 
more nationally and globally and however we can. It's all about building networking. And that I think is what a lot of folks have been saying, right? The OER, folks in the OER world are some of the best folks. And so it's just a really great network to, to get into. So that's another part of the sustainability piece. The last piece on sustainability uh, is a new phase that we're moving into, which is to create a framework where folks can um, review their resources for inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. The idea is, IDEA is our, our acronym for that. And this framework is meant to be for any resource it's not quite live yet. It'll, I think we're going through some piloting. It should be ready to go in um, a few months. And it's for any resource, but of course, the, um, the beauty of OER is when you find gaps, you can fill them. And so look for that. And then if you wanna connect, um, that's our link. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And, uh... Yeah, I put the link in the chat. It's up above some of the comments there. Um, and uh, I think people should see it. Oh, yes. And let's not forget to applaud the presenters. I keep forgetting that. Um, but it's good to have people applauding in the chat because that reminds me. Uh, we got a question from Ebba. And she writes that she's concerned about some issues in OER. And I think these are good issues. And because it was your turn to present, Suzanne, you have to answer it. Um, how to move OER outside the classroom? And again, that's something that came up earlier, right? Uh, second, about accessible OER. And, uh, that, again, that was talked about a bit earlier, but how do we actually manage that? Third, about the language issues. Most OER are in English. Um, so the question, you know, how to reach a larger target group uh, at all kinds of levels and needs. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm going to actually start with the second one because this has been a passion of, of mine is building accessible resources. So anybody that creates through us, we, we have accessibility specialists and it has to be accessible. Yeah. We've also been building a lot of our resources in labor text, and they have been working with us to make sure that their platform is accessible. It has uh, checks and, and all sorts of things. So we've been working really hard to make sure that at least our content is accessible and labor text has been creating some really neat accessibility um, components for us. And the other languages issue, that's, a, that's an interesting one. We do have a few Spanish resources created uh, just because there are a lot of Spanish speakers in our state. Uh, and yes, that would be the next phase, right? Like getting these to be actually translated uh, by humans into other languages would be awesome. But yes, no answers, just yeah. that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, translation though is super expensive. I know that working in the government here in Canada where everything has to be done in both official languages. Um, and yeah, that, that adds a lot of cost to a project. But I live and breathe by automatic translation. That has been my life-saving technology in my career. Uh, it's been so useful and I'm hopeful that this kind of technology will help reduce a lot of the expenses and the overhead, not just in languages, but also in accessibility. Just my view. Uh, but I don't have a seven minute presentation, so I should shut up. And we're actually to the last presenter, hard to believe. I can't believe, well, I can't believe it because I've been keeping count, but um, Judith Sebesta is our last presenter, unless I've made a horrible mistake. Um, Judith serves as, a, as executive director of the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas and the president of the Executive Council of CCCOER, which I'm thinking she will tell us what that stands for. Oh, um, and she is a graduate uh, not the only one in this program, of the Creative Commons Certificate for Educators program. So, Judith, over to you. Thank I you. You've already <laughs> taken the stage. <laughs> Thank you. And CCC OER is the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, as I think many of you know. Uh, but thanks for that kind introduction, Stephen. And what I wanted to talk about today 
uh, let's get, get that going there, there we go, um, was just to give a taste of statewide open education initiatives and resources. And because it is only a taste, I have provided a Google Doc. I put that link in the chat that has links to these resources and others. But I thought it might be fun to start with a little sing-along for us. So if you'll indulge me for a moment and get your pipes warm and get ready to clap in what I think you know are the appropriate places, let's set the scene. The stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. The prairie sky is wide and high, deep in the heart of Texas. The coyotes well along the trail, deep in the heart of Texas. The rabbits rush around the brush, deep in the heart of Texas. The chicken hawks are full of squawks, deep in the heart of Texas. The oil wells are full of smells, deep in the heart of Texas. Okay, guess that's our Texas scene. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. But to get a little more serious, just want to share. As I mentioned, I just give an overview of some resources that are statewide in Texas. Uh, my organization was not directly involved in the creation of our statewide OER repository. This is has been developed by the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and they contracted with the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education who created OER Commons to develop and maintain this Texas microsite for OER. And it was launched in September 1st of 2020 and is growing exponentially. My organization is responsible, uh, along with Carrie Gitz, who is the head librarian at Austin Community College, for the development of Texas Learn OER, which is a set of 10 peer-reviewed openly licensed modules for faculty, staff, and administrators. It's self-paced, so you can take this at any time. And again, you can find a link to this in that Google Doc. And I'm so pleased that we were honored with an OE award in 2020 for this training. So please check it out if you have a chance. And thank you for that OE Global. Oh, I love that, Alan. That's great. <laughs> We also co-organize with the Texas Digital Library and again, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, a annual statewide conference, Open Texas. And this was held last virtually March 11th through 12th in 2021. And our next conference is scheduled for September 21st to the 23rd, 2022. It will be virtual again and stay tuned for information about how you might submit a proposal and or attend. Everybody is welcome, not just Texans. We also collaborate with the coordinating board and ISKME on a biennial survey on OER programs, policies, and practices at two and four year public and private, nonprofit, and health related institutions in Texas. We began doing this in 2019 and we just did our most recent survey in 2021. And again, the links to both of those reports of those surveys are available via that Google Doc. And the final thing I wanted to share is just some infographics that I developed. One is on why use OER. It's a nice infographic that you can take and edit for your own context that gives information about, uh, you know, for OER advocacy and OER advocates. And then there's an infographic there with some of these resources I've talked about in others for open education in Texas. Open Texas is open is the last thing I wanted to say. And again, um, you've got that link to that uh, Google Doc with these resource, resources and initiatives there. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, right, everyone. We've got, got applause coming through and you caught me typing and mistyping the uh, URL in the chat. So that's what happens when I try to do two things at once. Last time I was in Texas, I got caught in a snowstorm and blizzard. Um, oh, oh. It was, a, it was a, an infamous conference in uh, Arlington hosted by George Seaman. So it was a lot of fun. Oh, sure, um, sure, yeah. 
but I did spend three months in Austin in 1980 uh, or 81, I should say, which was a blast. I have fond memories of Texas, although I never did learn to sing that song, and I thought that was probably for the best. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a very different town now, I would say, Stephen, but those of us who have lived here for a while are trying to keep it weird, I promise. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a, a pretty cool town back in 1981. I hung out a lot in a punk bar called Raul's uh, just across the road from the University of Texas. It's probably not there anymore. Um, <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> punk, though. Um, anyhow, uh, we didn't really get an answer to the question that got asked a few times about uh, extending OER outside the academic arena. Uh, you know, I don't work in academia. I work for the government. Nobody's more surprised about that than I am. Uh, but it gives me a bit of a perspective because, you know, my client base, if you will, is everybody and not just the people who are at college or university. And so the question of OERs reaching everybody is something that matters a lot to me. And uh, so that's the sort of question I always like to see answered. We got maybe two minutes left. Does anyone have any comments on that? Now that I've put you all on the spot. Nobody, not even Alan? Okay, oh, we'll leave it hanging. Uh, we're going to do this again uh, because it's been fun. And uh, I'll be a much better presenter next time. Uh, things I've learned doing this. Uh, I learned that if you get everybody's, the pronunciation of everybody's name ahead of time, write it down so you don't forget it during the actual uh, presentation. I've also learned bring a gong. So I'll have to go out and get a gong. Um, and that's mostly what I've learned. Aside from getting a bunch of really fabulous resources uh, about the work that people are doing these days in open educational resources, a, a, a very alive and very vital part of our educational and ed tech community. Cable Green is thanking all the speakers. Sybil is saying, I bet a lot of people use WikiHow and Wikibooks. Yeah, and I would add Pressbooks and YouTube and all of the rest. There's a ton of stuff out there. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, and uh, before we go, I want to acknowledge Jen Rain Wexler who did all of the actual real work in setting this up. Uh, I just came along at the very last minute to grab all the glory because that's how I do things. Um, but, uh, you know, she should be applauded for the work that she put in. And of course, to Creative Commons for sponsoring it generally. I hope you enjoy the rest of Open Education Week. I'm Stephen Downs. And uh, that's it for this time. Look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks so much, everyone.